The Night Beat starts right now. Our top story tonight, Governor Greg Abbott says he no longer has COVID. Yeah, in a video posted on social media, the governor says he got a negative COVID test today. Governor Abbott, who is fully vaccinated, tested positive on Tuesday. He's been in isolation at the governor's mansion. Just a day before his positive test results, the governor attended an indoor event in Collin County. The governor used the video shared today to urge more Texans to now get vaccinated. I'm told that my infection was brief and mild because of the vaccination that I received. So I encourage others who have not yet received the vaccination to consider getting one. My wife also continues to test negative. The governor goes on to say that he'll be working towards opening more infusion centers for antibody therapy across Texas. For now, he's staying isolated upon doctors' requests. And new tonight, JVSA announcing they will now have booster shots for those beneficiaries who are immunocompromised beginning this coming Monday. The San Antonio market will be offering third doses of the Pfizer vaccine. The CDC recommends a third dose at least 28 days after a second dose of Pfizer or Moderna. This includes those receiving cancer treatment, organ transplants, stem cell, people with HIV and more. For details on a full list of who qualifies, head to ksat.com. Taking a look at other stories we're following tonight. New developments for a stabbing we first told you about on the news at 5. San Antonio police have arrested a suspect in connection with the stabbing off of South New Braunfels near I-37 South. That incident happened around 2.30 p.m. over on the southeast side. San Antonio police say an 18-year-old was allegedly stabbed by his taxi driver. That teen was taken to Bamsey in critical condition. Hours later, police were able to use a tracking device to locate that taxi driver. He was found at an HEB near San Pedro and Olmos. That's where he was taken into custody. Police say it's still unclear what led to that stabbing. Also new tonight, the Bear County Sheriff's Office announcing the death of an inmate who was found unresponsive in the booking section of the jail. The inmate was discovered around 11.40 a.m. today. Detention and medical staff began performing life-saving measures. However, the 66-year-old inmate was pronounced dead by SAFD nearly 25 minutes later. The Bear County Medical Examiner's Office is working to determine the inmate's cause of death. We now know the name of a woman who was hit and killed while riding her bike earlier this week over on the north side. The Bear County Medical Examiner's Office has identified her as 39-year-old Cynthia Person. That crash happened Thursday morning at the intersection of Wurzbach Parkway and North Wiedner Road. San Antonio police say Person didn't stop at the red light and kept going, resulting in her being hit by a car. Person was pronounced dead at the scene. Also during that crash, police say Person's boyfriend allegedly pulled a machete and threatened the driver. A witness intervened. That driver not expected to face any charges. A shooting suspect in custody, one person critically injured and two lives lost. That was the outcome of a triple shooting from earlier this month. Today, the family of the two fatal victims meeting up at a celebration of life event. Now, I spoke with those who knew the victims closely. They say they are grateful the person allegedly responsible has been caught. They really were a set of angels. Um, Honestly, together, friends and family of both 28 year old Serena K. Bain and 38 year old Jonathan Fan gathering for a celebration of life event in their honor. The two died earlier this month after Bear County Sheriff's deputies say a dispute escalated into a shooting near Loop 1604 and Roddy Road. That shooting resulting in the death of Bain and Fan while also critically injuring a third victim. Deputies say this man, Fernando Rojas, was responsible for the fatal shooting. He was arrested after deputies found him in Las Vegas. I just feel like a piece of my soul has just been ripped out of my chest, you know. I'll never get it back. That man needed to be caught. You know, it, he took two people's lives, you know, that meant the world to a lot of people. During the celebration, people enjoyed food, music, and memories, both of Bane. She lived her life every day trying to protect somebody. A free spirit, you know, like I said, she was just so genuinely like an amazing soul. And fan. Always willing to help if you had any car problems, if you didn't have a place to go, like he was always the man that people called. He can make anything funny. And just you have that awkward moment where you look over at him and he just gives you that smile like, mm-hmm. The family say they're going to continue to pray for each other as they mourn. They're with each other, so as long as he's got her with him, then they know that he's going to be protected. Now, friends have identified the third victim who is now at home recovering from his injuries as Joe Bunch. As for the suspect, Rojas, he's facing two felony murder charges. 
An argument between two people ended up with one person being shot at several times and the other in police custody. The shooting happened just before midnight Friday at a home off Wild Turkey West, not far from Thousand Oaks Drive in Henderson Pass. San Antonio police say the homeowner asked the other man to leave after staying with him for a few days. Well, the man refused and an argument began. Eventually, police say the homeowner allegedly shot at the man several times, following him into the backyard. When police arrived, the homeowner told police that the man was in the backyard. He suffered a gunshot wound to the chest and was taken to Bamsey in critical condition. So far, no charges have been filed. A woman is in serious condition after San Antonio police say she got caught in the middle of a street racing crash over on the west side. That crash happened just after 1.30 this morning near Bandera Road and Bloomfield Drive. Police say two Dodge Challengers were allegedly racing when they hit the woman who was crossing the street. That woman taken to University Hospital with severe injuries to her legs. Police say neither of the drivers stopped after the crash. Plumes of smoke filling the air today in Hockley, Texas. That's about 35 miles northwest of Houston. The smoke coming from a large industrial fire. Now take a look at this. The thick smoke could be seen as far as 15 miles away, according to Harris County Fire Marshal spokesperson. They also say the fire began when steel drums fell over inside the facility that handles recycled plastics and other chemical materials. Nearby roads were closed while crews battled the fire. Back here at home, high school seniors are getting an up-close look at what it takes to be a Bear County Sheriff's Deputy. Today, kicking off the BCSO Career Camp. The 19th's John Paul Barajas explains how they are hoping to bring in more recruits. The Bear County Sheriff's Department is looking for new and young recruits. They're hitting the classrooms to find high school seniors who have an interest in law enforcement and introducing them to their career camp. It's going to be giving them an overall view of the Sheriff's Office. Uh, we're going to start processing them so that when they graduate, they're able to start their, their employment, start their career with us. Sheriff Javier Salazar explains the camp, which runs every third Saturday of the month, will go over de-escalation techniques, combat medical training, law enforcement tactics, and self-defense, just to name a few of the topics. Because I want y'all to be excited, right? I want y'all to be excited about it. So bring a friend. They need to be a senior. This year, camp starting early. The goal, to get more recruits and to be able to meet with students before some choose the armed forces. It's absolutely admirable for those that want to serve our country and join the military. We're letting them know early on that, look, we're also an option for you as well. We realized that had we done it earlier in the year, we probably could have doubled or tripled that number of kiddos that were coming in. And so today, I think we've got about 12 in the class. But I think that as the school year goes on and as we have more career camp sessions, I think this group's going to grow. Today, those in attendance were shown around the Sheriff's Department's headquarters and given some personal insight, not just on what to expect on the job, but about benefits as well. There's things that they can start doing now to make sure that their retirement years are better. So that's why we want to get the parents involved for sure. And the sheriff said today they had 12 kids in attendance. And as he mentioned in the story, he believes that number will grow. And if you know a high school senior who wants to join or is interested, all they have to do is show up to the program and participate, or they can email the sheriff's department. And we'll have that link on our website. John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. John Paul, thank you. Now, tomorrow, GMSA will be speaking with the president and CEO and North San, San Antonio Chamber of Commerce. Some topics of discussion will be the new companies arriving in San Antonio, the future of our economy, and more. That's happening at 8 a.m. You can submit your questions right now at ksat.com. Outside the live camp tonight, hope your weekend got off to a great start today. A few lucky yards. Picked up a little bit of rain this afternoon. We had some spotty downpours moving through a few rumbles of thunder as well, uh, but mainly just some pockets of brief heavy rain. Didn't result uh, or add up to much at the airport, just a trace of rain reported today. Our high temperature this afternoon for the fourth day in a row, 98 degrees. We're going to get uh, right there or very, very close to that triple digit mark over the next several days. Even tomorrow, I think we could jump up to 99. And honestly, it wouldn't surprise me if we touch 100 tomorrow into Monday, Tuesday of next week. No rain chance tomorrow or for the next few days. We'll toss some low end rain chances back in by the middle of next week. We'll talk more about that. Get you ready for the rest of the weekend coming up in just a bit. Still ahead on the night beat, a couple, their one year old daughter and a family pet all found dead in the Sierra National Forest. Why California officials are now pointing to toxic algae as a possible culprit. Plus, fighting against time, that's what White House officials are saying in regards to getting troops out of Afghanistan tonight. We have the latest on those efforts. 
And it's been around 30 years since the New England area has had to brace for a hurricane. What residents can expect there is Hurricane Henri inches closer. Henri strengthened toward hurricane today as it moved along the east coast. The storm is forecast to make landfall on Sunday at or near hurricane strength on New York's Long Island and Connecticut. Here's ABC's Trevor Alt with the latest. Tropical storm Henri strengthened to a category one hurricane Saturday as it traveled along the Atlantic coast. Henri is expected to make landfall on New York's Long Island or southern New England sometime Sunday. Residents across the region are being urged to prepare for strong winds, heavy rain and potential storm surge. You need to listen to your local responders. You need to listen to your local officials and take their advice of what they're asking you to do. This area has seen a lot of rain over the last several weeks, and so I'm really concerned about the uh, stability of the trees and we probably will see several trees go down. Connecticut under a state of emergency. Flooding, a concern for so many there. If you live in those coastal areas where you normally get flooding at the time of high tide, get all your property secured properly and batten down for a possible storm. In New York, Governor Cuomo also issuing a state of emergency for parts of the state ahead of the storm's arrival. We're pre-positioning heavy equipment all throughout Long Island, all throughout the Hudson Valley and the Capital District region. We're preparing water rescue teams for Long Island uh, and swift water rescue teams for the Hudson Valley uh, and in Westchester. Suffolk County issuing a voluntary evacuation for Fire Island, urging everyone to leave Saturday night. Ferry service already suspended for Sunday. Long Island Railroad service will also be canceled as of midnight, and the Port Authority is expecting numerous flight cancellations. But many New Yorkers are taking it in stride. Oh my gosh, we've been living here forever. We've been through all of them. Not <laughs> our first rodeo. Henri could be the first hurricane to make landfall on Long Island since Gloria in September of 1985. Phil Lipoff, ABC News, New York. Meanwhile, we are getting new images in tonight of the widespread damage left behind after now tropical storm Grace plowed through Veracruz, Mexico. Take a look. You can see flooded, muddy roads throughout the area. In some areas, that water is waist deep. Officials there reporting at least eight people missing tonight. Mexico's president has urged residents to seek refuge in shelters or take higher ground. According to the National Hurricane Center, Grace made landfall on the Gulf Coast of Mexico with maximum sustained winds of at least 120 miles per hour. And Katie, we're really just getting into the heart of hurricane season mm -hmm. here. End of August, September, really the peak. Yes, uh, we are rapidly approaching that, uh, just climatologically speaking, the time when the Atlantic Basin is most active. So when we see the highest number of uh, anything from tropical storms all the way up to hurricanes and actually of note, Grace, before it made landfall yesterday, jumped up to Category 3 hurricane status. So that did make it the first major hurricane of this hurricane season. Remember, a major hurricane is a Category 3 or above. Meanwhile, here at home, we had some spotty downpours this afternoon. We were thinking they were going to stay closer to the Gulf Coast, but they had a lot of staying power and made it all the way up to the Highway 90 corridor, uh, even about as far north as Canyon Lake over to Bernie and Bandera County there. There wasn't much rain in these downpours. They popped up, put down some very brief heavy rain, but it really didn't add up to much. Uh, again, a trace of rain only at the airport. Our radar estimates that maybe a few lucky yards here on the east side, far west side, out near Alamo Ranch, and then down near Elmendorf, perhaps picked up maybe a quarter to a half inch of rain. Those are going to be very, very isolated instances. Down 35, Pearsall, Dilly, even north of Catula. There were some healthy downpours there as well, and you could have picked up maybe a tenth to a quarter inch of rain from those thunder showers this afternoon. There were a few rumbles of thunder here or there, but no severe weather. As things stand currently, really quiet out there. Any activity that lingered into the early evening hours has fizzled out, so we're rain free. And as far as cloud cover goes, really not much to see uh, now that those thunder showers from earlier in the day have dissipated. So clear to mostly clear skies right now. 85 in Pleasanton, 86 in Hondo, down to 79 in Carrizo Springs, but it's still 90 in Del Rio. It's very muggy. Our dew points are elevated. They tried to fall off slightly this afternoon, but now they're back into the 70s, just shy of 70 
70 in Del Rio, but you get the idea. Oppressive humidity still in place. Uh, but once again, this evening, just like the past couple of evenings, the breeze has been there to help us out. Uh, today it's been about 10 to 20 miles per hour. It is starting to drop off tonight. Winds dropping down to about 5 to 10 miles per hour from uh, Pleasanton up to Gonzales, but along and west of 35, that breeze is still going at a pretty good pace currently. Overnight winds will relax to just about 5 to 10 miles per hour. Partly cloudy skies starting to fill in by dawn tomorrow morning. I do think early in the day tomorrow we could have some periods of mostly cloudy conditions. Just some of those low clouds here or there. Uh, those will mix out by lunchtime tomorrow climbing into the low 90s by lunchtime already and then plenty of sun second half of the day on Sunday and that'll put our afternoon highs back in the upper 90s. Um, like I said, I wouldn't be surprised if not even tomorrow, but for the next couple of days we touch 100 degrees. I'm forecasting 99, uh, but if we can get our dew points to drop off a couple more degrees in the afternoon, that could help to push us to 100. So nonetheless, it's going to be hot. Across Texas currently, you'll notice we've got some activity kind of working uh, clockwise here through portions of Oklahoma and Missouri. There's actually a ridge of high pressure that is centered just off to our east. That's what allowed for those afternoon showers to sneak in today. As we get into the day tomorrow, early next week, this ridge is going to kind of move right over top of us, and that's going to bring our rain chances down to zero for the next several days. As we get into the middle of next week, it takes a jog off to open the door for a little bit of rain making energy to sneak in underneath that ridge of high pressure. And middle of next week, that's when we'll reintroduce some chances of rain. I'll be at very low chances of rain, just some isolated shower and thunderstorm activity kicking in by the middle of next week. Until then, we will continue to be hot. Heat index readings each afternoon peaking around 105, give or take a degree or two here or there. So stay cool, stay hydrated, guys. All those 99s. I see you, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. All right, Andrew, no Dak Prescott again today for the Cowboys in their third preseason game tonight against the Texans. When might we see him return to action? Uh, obviously not during the preseason. Mike McCarthy's kind of alluded to that throughout the offseason, basically saying if he didn't play through week two, he's probably not going to play next week. But the good news is he's back on track to start in week one. We've got the details on the latest on Dak. Plus, Alamo Heights looks to go back to back in district. Got that next. Football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. He's not playing tonight, but reports are the Cowboys quarterback Dak Prescott appears to be on track to start in Dallas's regular season opener against the defending champion Buccaneers. Prescott has been held out of team drills since the end of July in Oxnard because of a strain in his right sh throwing shoulder. Since then, he's had no setbacks and was seen throwing routes prior to the Cowboys' last preseason game against the Cardinals. Dallas heads to Tampa Bay for the opener on Thursday, September 9th. Tonight's second preseason game against the Texans just wrapped up. Houston defeated defeated Dallas 20 to 14. We'll have all the highlights coming up later this hour. Our big game coverage previews heads up to Alamo Heights where the Mules are preparing for their second full season under head coach Ron Ritterman. Alamo Heights won District 15 5A Division 2 outright last year, finishing 7 and 3 overall with a perfect 5 and 0 record in district play. They won their by district playoff opener against Far San Juan Alamo Southwest before bowing out in the second round. If the Mules are going to go back to back in, in district, they'll need to win the line of scrimmage. Offensive lineman Boone Hetrick is the anchor for the big boys up front, and he'll be protecting quarterback James Sobey while line linebacker Roan Irwin and defensive lineman Tommy Colligan highlight the defensive side of the ball. The good news? Things feel more stable this year compared to last. We had new coaches. We had work on all our weight rooms and facilities. We didn't have a home field. So we had brand new defense and everything like that. And it was definitely weird and we had to adjust to it. But I mean, I think that's what built our team and made us so great was we just learned to overcome adversity and we just, we just ran with it. We gotta be resilient. I mean, winning district, I mean, it kind of, I don't know, made us think we were better than we were, I guess, but um, we'll do better this year. I'm sure of it. We got a lot of kids back from last year's team, and, and we had an undefeated, undefeated JV team with some good young players, uh, but it still comes down to the best team and, and chemistry, so that's what we're working on. Alamo Heights will open their season next Friday at 7.30 p.m. against the Bernie Greyhounds. That's one of 10 games that's part of this year's annual Peanut Butter Bowl. Coaches from around the San Antonio area gathered at Hero Stadium today to talk about the food drive. For the first time, the event has expanded to 20 teams, including two high schools in the Austin area. Four of those games will take place this coming Friday night. Goal, pretty simple, collect peanut butter jars to combat chronic hunger. 
This is really neat. You know, I was I was excited when Coach Riddleman reached out to us to be a part of it. Uh, what a great opportunity for our program, for our players, just to give back to our community. It's our third year in the Peanut Butter Bowl. We've played Reagan every time, uh, and it's just exciting. You know, school starting, the game starting, and then it, you take all that excitement and try to get some donations going. And then, uh, you know, we really tried to hit it hard this year, and, and our community's really responded. I think the last few times that we've met with O'Connor, our stadium has been packed, and so uh, you know, what a great event that we could make it even better by saying, hey, let's not just pack the stadium, but let's pack all these boxes and everything with peanut butter uh, and make it better for others. The teams want to surpass the 23,000 jars of peanut butter collected in 2020. We have more information on how to participate and donate on the sports page at ksat.com. It is media day at Texas State today, and head coach Jake Spavadol feels ready to name a starting quarterback. He just decided not to tell reporters today, and we'll save that information for tomorrow. Regardless of who gets the nod for QB1, there's no doubt that this year's Texas State squad is deeper than in years past. And there are some signs of improvement after going 2-6 and six against Sunbelt Conference opponents last year. I really believe that what we're, what we're doing here is going to pay off, and the time that I've spent here is going to pay off. So I believe that the culture that we've instilled is, is going to pay off, and the guys that we brought in on this year is going to be a lot different because of the depth that we have and the players that we got all over the field. So I'm really excited to see what we can do, and uh, I think come September 4th, it's going to be a different team than the, everybody's seeing in San Marcos. Now, it is a tough test for the Bobcats on September 4th. They'll open up against Baylor in San Marcos at 6 p.m. And coming up later from the NAIST tournament, and Brandeis continues to be in force. They are now 16-0 on the season. It's going to be impressive to see what they do moving forward. We'll look forward to that in the next half hour. Thank you, Andrew. Yep. Stay with us. Welcome back. Let's get you caught up now on the latest in Afghanistan. White House officials are keeping their evacuation plans fluid as it becomes more challenging to get all U.S. troops out by that August 31st deadline. This is President Joe Biden approves additional troops to help with those evacuations. John Kirby, the Pentagon press secretary, held a press conference today giving an update to the situation. He says the U.S. military is establishing alternative routes for people to get to Kabul airport and access, access gates because of a threat posed by ISIS. The Taliban is reportedly aware of the new effort and the two sides are apparently coordinating. Officials say the new routes will be available to Americans, third party nationals and qualified Afghans. We're fighting against both time and space. That's really what we're that's what we're what, what we're uh, uh, that's the race that we're in right now. And um, and uh, we're, we're trying to do this as quickly and as, as safely as possible. Also at that news conference today, the Pentagon released the new number saying 22,000 people have been evacuated since the end of July. A mystery is surrounding the deaths of a California family who went hiking in Sierra National Forest. Their bodies found on the trail and now investigators are looking into whether toxic algae caused their deaths. ABC's Phil Lipoff has what led officials to this conclusion. This morning, investigators in California are facing a mystery. What killed a family of three found near a remote hiking trail? According to investigators John Garish, his wife Ellen Chung and their one-year-old daughter were reported missing after going on a hiking trip in the Sierra National Forest. After a 12-hour search, rescue teams found the three dead, along with the family dog. We have a, a healthy family, um, including their canine you know, deceased, and so we're looking for answers. Answers that so far have been elusive. Investigators say they initially believe the family of three died from carbon monoxide poisoning, as there are old mines nearby, but are now considering toxic algae blooms as a potential cause. The forest had been asking visitors to avoid parts of the park because of poisonous algae. The California Water Board also issuing a warning after several parts of the state tested for high levels of harmful algae blooms. The statement reading in part, due to the size and toxicity of the bloom with increased Increasing temperature this time of year, the bloom may proliferate and alter its potential to produce toxins. If you drink some of the water, either by mistake or purposefully, you can take some of that water and the cyanobacteria that are present and the toxins that they're producing into your body. But right now, it's still a mystery. Investigators are stumped and loved ones desperately waiting for answers. I've been here 20 years and I've, you know, seen a lot of things, but I've never seen an incident like this where there's zero explanation. 
And that was Phil Lipoff reporting. The Mariposa County Coroner is awaiting toxicology results, which are expected to take at least two to three weeks. Taking a look at other stories around America today, the NYPD investigating a suspicious death at City Field in Queens. The body of the 47-year-old discovered last night. Investigators believe he may have fallen from a second floor staircase, and it's unclear right now if his death was accidental. While City Field is home of the New York Mets, the rock band Dead & Company, made up of members of the Grateful Dead, uh, had a concert there on Friday night. The identity of the man has not yet been released. It is unclear if he died after or during that show. A massive storage facility fire is the cause behind evacuations of several blocks in the Washington State Fair in Puyallup, Washington. This is because the storage facility contains a thousand pounds of anhydrous ammonia, which is used in refrigeration. Anhydrous ammonia is an extremely toxic colorless gas that can cause burns, blisters, and can be fatal if inhaled in high concentrations. Central Pierce Fire and Rescue is letting some areas of the storage facility burn because it's safer than trying to put it out. There have been no reports of injuries. A shelter is set up for those evacuated. A California judge striking down a ballot measure that would allow Uber and Lyft drivers to be classified as employees eligible for benefits and job protection. The judge ruled the measure was unconstitutional. Voters approved that measure last November after Uber and Lyft and other services spent $200 million uh, and in, in its favor, making it the most expensive ballot measure in California history. Uber plans to appeal that ruling. This could lead to it going to the California Supreme Court. Still ahead, if your yard is getting a little boring to look at, then listen up. We'll bring break down some creative ways to spruce up your relaxation spot out back. Well, if you have an outdoor deck or patio, chances are it's gotten a lot of use over this past year. Maybe you've even spruced it up to make it a year-round living area. Well, 12 on your size, Marilyn Moritz tells us how to keep it looking good and even more importantly, how to keep it safe. I love my deck. <laughs> Jill Russo spends a lot of time outside at her home. Especially if the weather's nice and just sitting out here, just relaxing. A relaxing deck is also a safe deck. So here are three things to check off your maintenance to-do list. One, watch for wobbling. Railings that aren't secure can mean trouble. Just tighten the fasteners, screws and nails and replace the rusty ones. Hammer down the ones that are popping up too. So if any nails and fasteners won't go in, it could mean that there's a supporting joist or other structural element that's damaged and needs to be replaced. And if a screw or nail won't go in the wood, it could mean that the wood is too decayed. If you can poke a screwdriver into the wood more than an eighth of an inch, it's probably rotted and needs replacing. Next, for decks connected to your house, make sure the ledger board is secure. That's the long piece of wood that gets bolted to the house. If the connection can't support the load, you risk a deck collapse. The safest ledger connection goes all the way from the ledger on the outside through the wall of the house to connect to the interior floor support. It's called a rim joist. If you've got an older home, it's a good idea to have a professional deck inspector come and check. And third, stop the slipping. Some composite and plastic materials can get slick morning dew or rain. Traditional wood and aluminum are better at resisting slips, but you can always add rugs or mats to any material. Marilyn Moritz, KSET 12 News. Outside with live cam again this evening. Still warm out there. We've got a breeze hanging on, and that uh, breeze has really made things not terribly uncomfortable this evening. Uh, if yard work or some deck work is in your plans for tomorrow, just know it is going to be hot. Even by lunchtime, we're looking at temperatures jumping into the 90s, maxing out upper 90s tomorrow afternoon, but the heat index will likely peak around 105. So make sure you take breaks and stay hydrated. Uh, in just a few minutes, we'll talk more about Hurricane. Henri and some other weather making headlines across the country. That's coming up in just a few minutes. Taking a look right now at weather. Katie, I got caught up in that little pocket of rain that happened, and that wasn't bad, but it was the humidity that yeah. followed. Because the sun popped right back out Ooh. after the rain. So then it was, yeah, extra, extra steamy. Uh, we actually saw our high temperature for the day today before those spotty thunder showers rolled in. 98 once again. This was the fourth day in a row we hit 98. I made this joke on Twitter that now that we've got four days of 98, we've got the, the boy band, the whole group of them because there were four that got really mixed reviews on Twitter. 
really mixed reviews. I'm just trying to just trying to keep things fresh here. All right, uh, temperatures across the Pacific Northwest in the 70s today. Uh, also a, a touch cooler across parts of the Tennessee River Valley. 88 was the high in Chicago. That's still fairly warm and in the 80s uh, in New England and the Northeast as they brace for Henri. And we're going to talk more about Henri just uh, just shortly here. Uh, but there was another big weather story across the country today that you'll likely start to hear more about, especially tomorrow. There were heavy flooding rains just west of Nashville, Tennessee today. All these flood reports, um, the radar estimated rainfall goes up to the top of this legend here. So some places just west of Nashville picked up more than a foot of rain today in a very short amount of time. I saw a measured, so a confirmed total in this area of more than 17 inches of rain. Unfortunately, unfortunately, there have been fatalities and there are numerous people still missing. So this dangerous, uh, deadly flooding west of Nashville will also be a big weather story for the country as we head into the rest of the weekend, as will Henri. More on Henri shortly, but I do want to update you on what else we've got going on out in the Atlantic Basin. As of tonight, aside from Henri, there's one disturbance that the Hurricane Center has its eyes on, but over the next five days, very low odds that this could even become our next tropical depression. So, tropics-wise, the focus will stay on Henri here in the short term. Henri is a hurricane category one storm moving north at 21 miles per hour. So moving at a pretty good pace here. Maximum sustained wind gusts are up to 90 miles per hour as it approaches part of New England tonight. So here's the latest forecast cone. It does appear that at landfall, Henri is expected to be a Category 1 storm. Uh, my tiles here kind of shifted a little bit, but you get the idea. Sunday, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, this will be moving through parts of New England, Connecticut, Rhode Island, eventually Massachusetts. And then as we get into Monday, Tuesday of next week, it'll wash out over parts of Maine and then back into the open Atlantic. Rainfall potential, thanks to Henri, over the next two days. Highest totals will likely be 6-plus inches. There could certainly be some isolated totals more than eight inches uh, across parts of New England, even New York and New Jersey as Henri comes ashore. Uh, four to six inches will also be possible in and around New York City, off into New York State, and then a widespread two to four inches is a safe bet for those folks. Look, here at home, not much happening here across Texas. We're going to have a ridge of high pressure with us over the next two days, but also basically through the middle part of next week, um, and that's going to keep our rainfall chances minimal through Tuesday. We'll start to pick back up some lower end rain chances middle of next week. We'll be looking at some isolated afternoon downpours uh, by the middle and back half of next week. Until then, the heat is the story and it'll be another hot day tomorrow. 99 year high temperature heat index peaking near 105. Give or take a few degrees, uh, those heat index numbers will likely be higher down closer to the Gulf Coast tomorrow. South Southeast winds 5 to 15. Unfortunately, I don't think we'll have uh, quite as good of a breeze as we get into tomorrow afternoon and the next couple of days. Um, and again, I wouldn't be surprised if over the next three days or so we see our first 100 degree day here at the airports. Had to happen eventually. And honestly, 98, 99, 100. You won't feel the difference. It's just been a kind of mental thing up to this point. Uh, as those low rain chances kick in middle of next week, highs will come down just a touch. Guys, every time I see those nines, Katie, I think of that <laughs> song. Every song you start off, like, shout out to the nine nines in the 2000s. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Pop 2K. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. You're welcome. <laughs> I don't know anything you guys are talking about. It's not a Grateful Dead reference. It was not. And unfortunately, we had another story about them earlier today. <laughs> uh, as we mentioned earlier, the Texans and Cowboys met tonight. Cowboys still winless in preseason. Yeah, and it's because Houston's defense played really well. They got after the quarterback and got some key turnovers. When we come back, we'll recap today's preseason game. When Houston gets up a big win, moved to 2-0 in the preseason. Plus, Holy Cross looks for another deep playoff run this year. Got that preview for you next. Holy Cross is undergoing a, kind of a metamorphosis right now. For the first time ever in the history of the school, we will host home night football games on campus. Might still be under construction, but there's plenty for Holy Cross nights to look forward to as they prepare for the 2021 high school football season in big board sports. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Cowboys hosting the Houston Texans tonight at AT&T Stadium without defensive coordinator Dan Quinn. It was announced early in the first quarter that Quinn and defensive tackle Carlos Watkins would not participate as a precaution due to the NFL's COVID-related protocols. Both will be reevaluated tomorrow. 
Let's get to the game now, though. Perfect start for Houston. Jacob Martin gets after the quarterback, getting to Garrett Gilbert for the sack and fumble. Charles Amenahu recovers, and the Texans set up shop at the 23-yard line. Seven plays later, Mark Ingram powers over the goal line for the two-yard touchdown, 7-0 Houston. It's headed to the second quarter now. Game tied at seven. Cowboys answer back. Cooper Rush with a perfect pass to Cedric Wilson. That's a nine-yard score, and Dallas leads 14-7 at halftime. Third quarter, Houston's defense comes up with another takeaway. Lonnie Johnson gets the pick on the tip drill, and he is heading the other way for a 53-yard pick six. Texans win it and prove to 2-0 in the preseason, 20-14. Our big game coverage previews head to Holy Cross High School where the Knights look primed and ready for another deep playoff run. Last year, Holy Cross went 6-3 overall thanks to some standout performances from dynamic quarterback Jordan Battles and advanced all the way to the TAPS Division III state semifinals. This year, Battles is gone, but the Knights had plenty of talent on both sides of the ball, including wideout Marcus jimenez Cedillo and two-way player Amir Ali. How important was the experience the roster gained last season? It was very important because uh, I, know what, I know what it feels like. And um, I want to get back to that same experience and go further than what we did last year. Uh, we went through a lot last year. We made it to the quarterfinal, but this year it's given a lot of the returners that, that edge and wanting to get back to where we were last year and, and finish that job. Holy Cross will open their season at home against Bernie Geneva this Thursday at 7.45 p.m. Brandeis head coach Maddie Williams celebrated her 500th career win this week, and the Broncos added a few more to that total this afternoon at the NEISD tournament at Littleton Gym. Semifinal matchup today here against Harlan. First set, Broncos on a roll. Carly Ferris gets it over to Jalen Gibson, and the TCU commits team up for a spike. It's a three-point lead. A few points later, Ferris calls her own number with a dump shot, and suddenly the lead balloons to seven. Hawks do stay within striking distance, though. Carrington Crawford hits one off the block and down, but that's not going to work twice against this Brandeis defense. A few plays later, Austin Smoke gets up for the block, and the Broncos win it 25-12, 25-13 to advance to the championship match, where they defeated Smithson Valley two sets to one and improved to 16-0 on the season. We have more highlights available from the tournament right now on the sports page at ksat.com. And we'll stay on the volleyball court with one of the coolest points you'll see this year. Canyon Lake against Madison last night. This is Maddie Overholzer with a kick dig out of bounds, and it's going to somehow land inbounds on the other side of the net. The Mavs can't believe it, neither can the Hawks. Maddie using her soccer instinct. She's on the soccer team on that play. Madison did take the match two sets to none. That is certainly a moment to remember for Maddie, and I believe it was the athletic director who reached, reached out to us Made sure we saw that play. I'm glad he did. That is so legit. Yeah. No hands in soccer, but you can use your feet in volleyball. That's how it works. Very cool, however you get it there. That's, that's all that matters. Thank you, Andrew. Stay with us. We'll be back. Finally tonight, something good. Now, for the past year, a little free library has been tucked away in one neighborhood in Boston. Now, what makes this library special is its focus on anti-racist reading material. However, when heavy rainfall hit the area back in May, it caused the little library to collapse. She was planning on rebuilding it for the fall, but this week she saw someone had already done the work for her. Not knowing who it was and um, knowing that somebody had taking the time and taking the energy to put it back together was really special. Well, eventually they figured out who fixed the little library. It was another neighbor who went to Ikea and bought all new materials to rebuild it. He says he just wanted to keep the positivity in the area. Good story there. All right, next few days, it is still going to be hot. I know you're surprised. Wouldn't be surprised if we see our first 100 degree day in San Antonio through early next week. Middle back half of next week, things will change slightly. Lower in rain chances sneak back in as the ridge moves north. Guys. Thank you, Katie. That is all of our time for tonight. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to catch Good Morning San Antonio tomorrow morning starting at 6. Have a good night.